Hi, I'm Jacob Hornberger, president of the Future of Freedom Foundation. I'm joined by Sheldon Richmond, the foundation's vice president. This is The Libertarian Angle, the show that brings you the libertarian perspective on what's going on in the world. Uh, Sheldon, we had this massacre, horrific massacre in France uh, last week in which, uh, I don't know, 17 people were killed uh, by uh, a gang of terrorists. Uh, it was flat out murder uh, for there's this group called Charlie Hebdo that's been publishing these cartoons and perspectives that make fun of Islam and, and Muhammad and had been going, doing it for many, many years from what I understand. And all of a sudden, the uh, pro-Islamic radicals uh, went in there and just on a murder spree killed, uh, killed many of the staff and then went off and uh, held some hostages, killed some of those hostages, and were finally killed. From what I understand, they're still one of the suspected conspirators in the operation that's still free. Uh, but you did a, a really insightful analysis of this in your TGIF column on Friday. So why don't you lead out and give us your perspective about this whole controversy? Uh, sure. Uh this is uh, Char Charlie Hebdo is a weekly uh, magazine, uh, and it's used to have other. It has had another, at least one other name in its past. So it's been around for a while, uh, and uh, it uh, sort of specializes in in uh, cartoons and articles poking fun at uh, uh, not just Muslims, but it's it's taken on Catholics. It's it's had some unflattering uh, cartoon images of the of the Pope. Uh, and uh, it's going after, it's uh, also done the same thing with uh, or, uh, Orthodox Jews, uh, and so it's uh, you know it sees itself as, a, as sort of this. Um, some people think it's rather sophomoric actually, uh, and it's come in for a lot of criticism over the years. But it sees itself as sort of an equal opportunity, uh, you know, uh, uh, satir uh, satirizing a newspaper or a magazine. Uh, but uh, over the years, it's been accused of of being uh, racist or borderline racist. The uh, the, the images are uh, often unflattering when they're about Muslims and Arabs. Uh, you know, there's the big noses, the kinds of things that uh, would get you criticized in the U.S. If, for example, you were portraying uh, Jews that way, uh, Arabs seem to be a little open season on Arabs and Muslims. Um, so anyway, that, that's the reputation it had. It wasn't really the darling of everybody. But then you have these three, these two, actually two guys who uh, last Wednesday went into the offices and in what looks like a professional you know, uh, operation that was the result of training at Kalishnikov rifles. They went in and, and, as you say, perpetrated a massacre. They killed 10 uh, staff members, uh, they, uh, two policemen, I think one was a policewoman. Uh, one, you know, one was just like a janitor of the building, one was a, a journalist who was visiting the building, but then they, they wiped out most of their cartoonists and the editor who went by the name of Sharb. Uh, and so, yeah, a ho horrendous act of murder by, uh, by two brothers, uh, Kawashi brothers, their names are Saeed and, uh, and Sharif uh, Kawashi, who were French, born in, French, in France, French citizens. Parents were Algerians, because France uh, uh, one time, of course, uh, had Algeria as a colony, became uh, independent in the early 60s, so, and, and Algerians had moved to France over the years. Uh, so these were French uh, uh, nationals. They weren't uh, uh, from another country that you know, sneaked in or uh, infiltrated or none of that. They were, they were educated in, uh, in, in French schools. And they, you know, they committed this horrendous uh, murder, yelled things like, we avenge the, the Prophet Muhammad. There are some uh, uh, people, especially among the more uh, uh, violent-prone uh, uh, sects, who say it's a blasphemy to portray Muhammad, uh, you know, in a picture or in a cartoon. But there are, uh, I've, I've also read that uh, uh, that's nowhere in the Quran. That's not a... Uh, that's not a crime of any kind. In fact, uh, Fareed Zakaria had an interesting column over the weekend in the uh, Washington Post about how blasphemy, the concept of blasphemy, blasphemy does not appear uh, in the Koran, and there is no punishment or any kind of penalty prescribed for blasphemy. Uh, that, that when blasphemy was uh, encountered by Muhammad, he, he engaged in education to teach people uh, to, to be more respectful. So uh, there's dubious authority even in the Quran for what these guys do. Anyway, you had those two brothers do that. And then the next day, there was another guy who, uh, by the way, the brothers were since killed in the police standoff uh, on uh, Thursday, I think, or Friday. And then there was another guy who took hostages. And I'm not sure the connection between these two things. I mean, the 
it might have been, but I'm not sure this was a coordinated thing. But there was a guy na uh, named uh, uh, Kulabali who uh, went into a, uh, a kosher uh, market in uh, a gro like a grocery store in the, a, a Jewish section of Paris, took hostages, uh, ended up killing uh, four before he, uh, before he was killed. So, uh, yes, terrible thing. There, there, there was a woman originally implicated, but it turned out she left the country on, on January 1st or 2nd and is, is in, is, was seen in Syria. Uh, so we're not sure what her role is. She was the common-law wife of uh, Kulabali, the, the guy that uh, went into the, uh, the, the kosher market. So it's, uh, that's the story. The three principles are dead. Of course, we're looking to see if there's a larger sleeper cell or, you know, where they got training. Uh, the, the Kwashi brothers, at least one of them, had, had Syria. So there, there are connections. Uh, one thing we've learned, though, through various uh, ways, and if, including an interview with one of the brothers a couple of years ago, is that these guys were radicalized by what, by what, what was going on in Iraq and the Middle East uh, in the 2000s. I mean, they, they were aware of the Iraqi uh, occupation and Abu Ghraib. In other words, the U.S.-led effort uh, to, uh, you know, to occupy and rule uh, Iraq, and they uh, and they were also, of course, keeping up on what was going on in Syria. So I think we can't separate this. Not that anything can justify what, the murder, but there's no way we can look at this in a vacuum and just act like these were three guys wandering off the streets and, and uh, sh shooting up uh, and killing people, as, as terrible as it is, as unjustified as that is, uh, we have to look at the bigger picture and, and fit it into the whole uh, uh, treatment of the Middle East by Western countries. Uh, and so that's that's my take on it. Yeah, I, I think on the surface of it, it, it just has all the appearance of a straight murder case, that uh, people got outraged over the fact that, that their religion was being uh, sullied here, mocked, ridiculed. Uh, they take high-powered weapons, they go in there, retaliate, and kill the people that are doing it. On the, on the face of it, it looks like, well, it's just a straight murder case. But I agree with you. I, I don't think that you can separate it out from the context of what's been going on in the Middle East with U.S. foreign policy, which France has been part of for many, many years. I mean, if you look at the Afghanistan war, uh, France has been part of that. And in fact, I was kind of surprised that that the French government says we're declaring war on terrorism as a result of this. Well, what have, what have they been doing for, you know, all these years since the U.S. invaded Afghanistan since the 9-11 attacks? That was the war on terrorism. That wasn't just a foreign policy regime change operation. It was all part of this context that we have to wage war on terrorism. Uh, and and when we look at, at the 9-11 attacks, I mean, to me, this is kind of like a variation of the 9-11 attacks. Uh, people were shocked. Americans were shocked. They were angry and so forth. And I remember during that time, you and I and others here at, at the Future Freedom Foundation were saying, look, is it too soon to, to examine foreign policy here? And we got inundated with all the hate mail that says, oh, you're blaming it on the U.S. You're blaming it on us. It was all like, you're blaming us for this, you know. Well, no, what we were saying is look at the U.S. government and what it has been doing in the Middle East to precipitate the anger and hatred that has gone into this attack. And uh, people couldn't do that. I mean, they just, it was like, oh my gosh, stop criticizing my federal daddy. Uh, this is wrong. You're, you're justifying what it was done. Well, motive and justification are two separate things here. And here in France, you've, the immediate motive is, is this sullying, the mocking, the ridicule of the, uh, of the religion. But it's the larger context, Sheldon. It's, it's the anger that has been building up um, year after year. It, it just the killing of people in Iraq, the killing of people in Afghanistan with, with no remorse whatsoever. I mean, our side doesn't even keep track of the dead on the other side. It's like they don't matter. They, they bomb wedding parties and so forth. How can this anger and hatred not be part of the driving force? And I think even the mainstream media is acknowledging that. Uh, I, I read an article over the weekend where they're now pointing back to Anwar al-Awlaki and the role that his videos have played in inciting people and making people angry. Uh, well, all this is to say that this is another reason why we need to be re-examining this whole imperialist mindset, this whole war on terrorism mindset, the troops in Afghanistan, the troops in Iraq, the, the weekly assassinations, the kill list, the torture, the whole kit and caboodle that has come with, with uh, U.S. policy in the Middle East. I mean, we don't see them doing this to Switzerland. 
We don't see them doing terrorist attacks in Switzerland. Uh, isn't it interesting that they seem to be picking the, the coalition partners, the part, the coalition of the willing uh, to, to engage in these kind of attacks? And um, well, I'll turn it back over to you. Well, I think there was a, a revealing uh, uh, thing that came out over the weekend uh, when uh, when Ahmedi uh, Koulibaly was in the uh, store, the, the kosher store. Uh, a reporter tried to call to speak to him on the phone, and uh, uh, Koulibaly picked up the phone. He picked up the phone, but then he simply put it down. So the line was still open, and so we have a recording that CNN was playing all weekend uh, of uh, – of uh, this uh, uh, man speaking, uh, I guess, you know, perfect French, uh, and, and explaining what he was doing to the uh, the victims, his potential victims in, in that store. Now, let me say at the outset, I don't, it probably was not a coincidence that he was in a kosher store. Uh, obviously, there, uh, uh, there are people who want to hold all Jews, every individual Jew, even who, if they live in France, responsible for what the Israeli government does to the Palestinians. And, of course, that's, uh, that's a form of racism. That's a form of collectivism. Uh, you know, there are many Jews who oppose that, those policies. So you can't, you can't just hold all Jews responsible for what the Israeli government is doing or, or even what the Israeli people support. Uh, so, so uh, you know, let me put that on the table first. So, but I'm not, it's not, I'm not saying it's a coincidence he was in a Jewish market. It probably was not. But what's interesting is what he said. When he was, I guess, being asked, why are you doing this, he said some very interesting things. He did not engage in an anti-Semitic rant. He did not engage in an anti, uh, uh, sort of anti-infidel rant. He didn't condemn those people as being Jews or infidels. Uh, that's not why he was uh, doing that. He told them he was doing that because those people, by paying their taxes, were supporting the, the military policies of the French government. That's exactly what he said. He said, you pay taxes. And, and so one of the patrons says, uh, but we have to pay taxes. And he immediately said, no, you don't. I don't pay. This is amazing. So then they said, but wait a second. Taxes go to schools and hospitals. And he said, 30 percent of your taxes go to the military, the French military. I mean, here's a guy who was prepared. You know, what, look, the guy's a criminal, no doubt. He was a killer. He's dead. But uh, he was a killer. And he terrorized these people before killing them. But this was not a lunatic's rant. I mean, this guy had actually thought things out. Now, we could say you're wrong just because somebody pays taxes doesn't make them accomplices in, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, killer policies abroad. Uh, you know, that's a complicated connection. But the guy's not just a raving lunatic. That's my point. He, he had a point to make. Uh, and then he said something very interesting. He said, I'm French. And if they weren't invading other countries, I wouldn't be here. Now, I interpret the here as being in the store, not being in France. It sounds like he's saying, look, I'm a Frenchman. I want to be part of French life. And I wouldn't be doing this if France and other countries weren't in the Middle East, you know, invading and bombing and, and stuff like that. And he specifically pointed out the bombing of, um, <clears throat> you know, the Islamic State. And uh, because, they, you know, people get killed, uh, civilians get killed, they, and they're aware of this. These guys, according to uh, many sources, and Juan Cole wrote about this this morning on his blog, uh, were, were radicalized, as, we, as they say, by uh, the invasion of Iraq and, and the revelations about Abu Ghraib. Now, it's true that France did not uh, approve of the initial invasion in Iraq, but it's generally been part of the uh, – it's, it's a member of NATO. It's been part of the NATO uh, coalition. Uh, the previous president of France, Sarkozy, pushed – was one of the leading uh, people pushing for, for um, intervention in Libya in 2011, which uh, – where there was bombing and uh, the overthrow of the, of the government. Uh, he's been involved – the French, of course, have been involved in Mali, uh, where uh, they, uh, there's a sort of an insurgency by, uh, by ra uh, uh, radicals who, who actually came out of Libya and got arms uh, out of Libya because of the uh, uh, overthrow of Gaddafi's government there. <clears throat> so you have all this going on. Uh, and, and like you say, it wasn't just three guys who wandered, off the, wandered in off the street deciding to kill people. Uh, there, there was a political motivation, which, again, is not to excuse. Use it, but uh, I can't see why anybody would resist it, attempting to understand, comprehend why people do things like this. I mean, they, everybody's wringing their hands. If you watch CNN or these shows all weekend, they're all wringing their hands about this is our new way of life. We have to constantly be on guard about these about these kinds of things in the United States, in France. In
in uh, Britain, everywhere, wringing their hands. What, you know, this is now a permanent fixture of life for the foreseeable future. What can we do about it? I didn't hear anybody step up and say, well, one thing we might do, do which may really uh, take away a lot of the pretext for this, is stop the intervention, stop the bombings, the dronings, the uh, rounding up of people, the checkpoints, all that stuff in Muslim and Arab countries. You know, no, no one wants to say that. That's the real heresy. You're not allowed to say that because that puts the, 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 the spotlight on U.S. policy and NATO policy. And for some reason, that's, you're not allowed to do that. That's unspeakable. Yeah, I, I recall the, the sentencing hearing of Ramzi Youssef. Uh, Youssef was one of the people who were responsible for the 1993 terrorist attack on the World Trade Center, which really was no different in principle. The 93 attack on the World Trade Center was no different in principle from the 9-11 attacks on the World Trade Center. Same thing, same motivation. And when they finally got Youssef into custody and they brought him back and they, they prosecuted him in U.S. District Court because terrorism is a criminal offense. It's not an act of war. And if you don't believe me, go talk to the federal judge uh, who, who, uh, who sentenced Youssef. And, and Youssef at his sentencing hearing, it's so revealing. I mean, you can just see the anger exude from what this guy's tirade was saying to this federal judge. And, uh, and whether you agree with it or not, you can see the anger where he's talking about, look what you people have done here in the Middle East. And he talked about the sanctions uh, in Iraq that were killing Iraqi children, uh, as an example. You've got, I mean, that was 93. And then think about it, three years later when the sanctions are still in place and 60 Minutes asked Madeleine Albright whether the deaths of half a million Iraqi children from the sanctions had been worth it. And by it, they meant, you know, a regime change operation in Iraq. Uh, Madeleine Albright said, now she's the world spokesman for the United States. Uh, she says effectively to the world, well, it's a tough decision, but yeah, we think it's been worth it. I mean, how can, how can the deaths of even one child, much less half a million children, be worth a regime change operation? And how more fundamentally is that not going to generate deep anger and hatred, especially if 99 percent of those children are Muslim? I mean, how can, how can a, a, a person who belongs to the Islamic faith not kind of like put two and two together and say, well, this is just more than a coincidence that all these people that are dying are Muslim, and then you've got so so nine so you before that then you've got the uh, the attack on the USS Cole, the attacks on the U.S. embassies. You've got the attacks here at Fort Hood, Detroit, uh, the would-be bomber there. They're all saying the same thing. They're on the same page. Look at what this government has done, along with its NATO partners and so forth. Um, they're in the Middle East and, and in Afghanistan. And so they use the 9-11 the attacks as the excuse to double down. They go down into Afghanistan. They do more of the same. They kill countless people. I would say 99 percent of the people they killed in Afghanistan had nothing to do with 9-11. How can that not make family members that, that have survived this onslaught angry and, and filled with rage, and especially when it's just going on and on and on? It never stops. I mean, they say they're out of Afghanistan, but there's still 10 to 15,000 troops there. Uh, so, yeah, it is interesting to see them saying, well, this is now part of our life. We are, we're saddled with this. We're going to wage war on terrorism. And really what it means is, Sheldon, a greater uh, infringement on the rights of the French people, which really aren't that tremendous in and of itself. I mean, they, they're talking about free speech rights. Come on. They put people in jail for questioning the Holocaust there. Now, regardless of where you stand on the Holocaust, I think most anybody who's a devotee of free speech is going to say, well, even if you take the position that it didn't occur, you shouldn't be put in jail for that. And yet that's what they do in, in, um, in France. So, you know, it's not like this is really the bastion of free speech rights. And they're going to they're going to experience the same thing that the U.S. is, is going to is has been experiencing since 9-11. Since Their government's going to use this as an excuse to invade the privacy. You're going to see more massive surveillance, the privacy of the French people, uh, inf assault on civil liberties. I mean, it's really the worst thing that could happen to the French people is this kind of terrorist attack. As Americans who now have to deal with the NSA, the FBI, the CIA, the surveillance, assassinations, torture, including of American uh, citizens, indefinite detention, 
All this comes about because uh, people engage in a terrorist attack driven by the anger and rage that interventionism produces within them. Right, and as far as the solidarity in behalf of free speech, of course, there was this huge uh, march, a million and a half people in the streets of Paris uh, yesterday, and everybody is saying, uh, you know, je suis uh, Charlie, I am, I am Charlie, and uh, uh, praising free speech, no matter how offensive it might be, which I, I, I agree, free speech, speech should be free. There's no right not to be offended, although I will add the fact that there's no right not to be offended doesn't mean there's an obligation to offend. I think people confuse those two things. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, the same people who are saying just we, uh, many of the same people who are saying just we, Charlie, in the United States these days support campus speech codes or they support hate speech laws. I mean, so they're inconsistent. In France, I mean, you can't make this stuff up. A few years ago, there was a columnist for uh, Charlie Hebdo, the very same Charlie Hebdo, who wrote a column. He's a cartoonist and, and writer, and he wrote a column making fun of the son of uh, former president, uh, French, pre French President Sarkozy. Uh, and uh, one remark in the column was regarded as, uh, you know, anti-Semitic. It was, it was rather mild, and uh, the, the son had married a, 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 an heiress to a French uh, and it was a, into a Jewish family. And so he made a remark about this lad will go far. That was regarded as anti-Semitic. And whether, you know, my point is not to argue whether it was or not. Let's assume it was. Uh, he gets sued by two organizations. And under the French law, you can get sued for inciting race hatred. Uh, and then his editor, the, the previous editor, not the one who was killed on Wednesday, but the previous editor of Charlie Hebdo, demanded that he apologize. Charlie Hebdo, keep in mind that he apologized. He refused. He got fired by Charlie Hebdo. Uh, where was the march in the streets for free speech, for tolerance, of, uh, for allowing satire, blah, 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 nowhere. Uh, in France, they have outlawed the burqa, the woman's uh, you know, full uh, body uh, cover, religious cover that, uh, that some uh, Muslim women uh, you, uh, wear, although not many French women, French Muslims were wearing them, but they outlawed it. Uh, they outlawed pro-Palestinian demonstrations in France. So this, uh, this idea that civil liberties have taken a huge blow and that we must stand up for French civil liberties everywhere and, and civil liberties everywhere, um, you know, it doesn't smell right because it seems very, very convenient. And it's invoked when it's, when it's uh, politically correct, let's say, and it's, it's sort of forgotten when uh, when that's the convenient thing to do. So it was very hard to watch that. And you had you had world leaders at the head of the march. You had uh, Netanyahu from Israel. And you can you imagine leading a march or helping the middle lead a march like this? I mean, uh, it, it was unbelievable. It was such a staged event by basically by the allies of the American empire uh, to present. I mean, in sort of 1984 George Orwell fashion, this propaganda that is easily destroyed by, by the slightest examination, by reading articles that have been published over the years to show that they don't even mean what they say. They don't mean what they say. Oh, uh, yeah, they got to keep that united front because they don't want anyone questioning <laughs> the basic principles of the empire. I mean, and, and, and let's face it, the French still reminisce and, and think nostalgically about their, their empire, which I think is one of their driving forces as to their intervention in Syria and, and Libya and, and Afghanistan. I mean, they, they, they still treasure those days when they could go in there and rule foreign peoples and control them and abuse them and insult them and treat them badly. And um, let, let me make two more points here, though. You know, this this kind of event could have very well have taken place in, without an interventionist foreign policy. There's no question. I mean, we, we see there's murders taking place all across the world. People may get angry over uh, the insulting of their religion. But my hunch, Sheldon, is that these types of things would be much less uh, happening much less without this foreign interventionism, without the U.S. constantly having troops in foreign countries and killing people and torturing people and renditioning people. I think that there's a layer of society that that simply that usually under ordinary circumstances, psychologically, emotionally, just stay under the radar screen and they live their lives and bad things happen and their religions are salted, but they just go along with it. They, they don't do anything. 
But as soon as all of a sudden you've got this interventionist foreign policy, or you've got the government doing bad things to people, that layer surfaces and starts doing things that they would never ordinarily do. Uh, I, I'll give you an example of, of like um, the, uh, the terrorist attack on the federal center in Oklahoma City by Timothy McVeigh. I think if that there had never been an attack on Waco and that massacre of the Branch Davidians by the federal government, that we would never have had the Oklahoma City bombing. I don't think McVeigh would have gone there and said, well, I'm just going to blow up this federal building. Um, and so, you know, here's an example of where the government does a horrific thing and it brings out this layer, this marginal uh, layer of people that just go ballistic. Uh, the other thing I want to say is that, that you know, I wouldn't have been surprised if this type of thing happened here in the United States. I mean, the French are all shocked and surprised. I'm not surprised. I just said a few weeks ago in an article, don't be surprised if this type of thing happens here in the United States because the assassinations are going on on a, on a weekly basis or monthly basis, on a regular basis. Uh, they're, they're killing people. They're killing people around these suspected terrorists. People get angry at that. Children get angry. Children grow up. They, they retaliate. And... Um, I think we better foresee the possibility that we're going to see another major attack here in the United States, just like in France. And that's why we need to keep talking right now, because when that happens, sound things, thinking is going to be in very short supply. Uh, the, the rationality is going to go out the window. They're going to be starting to talk about more infringements on civil liberties, more Patriot Acts, more surveillance, more attacks on some foreign country, more assassinations. Now's the time. Uh, now is the best time to be questioning this whole paradigm of empire and intervention. What has it brought us? I mean, Afghanistan's a fiasco. Iraq's a fiasco. The whole Middle East's a fiasco. I mean, what? I don't see any redeeming aspects to this foreign policy of intervention as an empire at all. I say, time to dismantle the whole thing. No, and I think I think things are going to be used in the other direction. I think the dominant narrative by uh, the administration and uh, and by the media, uh, which uh, the major media certainly that slavishly uh, delivers the message, is that uh, the events in Paris are sort of ex post facto justification, ex post justification for the intervention in the Middle East. It's as if they're saying, see, do you see why we have to intervene in the Middle East? They do things like this. So they reverse yeah. cause and effect. And they use the effect to prove, the, you know, the need for the cause. I mean, this is, you're already seeing this. You, all you need to, need to do is watch the cable news and see when they have these panel discussions, and they'll bring on uh, government spokesmen or former government people or think tank types that just parrot the government's line. And this is the message we're getting. Of course we have to do sort of this. We have to be there. Look what they did in Paris. So – yeah. It's going to be a, it's a very tough job for us to try to counter that. We're we're a relatively small voice, and we can take all the libertarians together and all the non-interventionists together. Uh, it's a it's a fairly weak voice compared to uh, the government and its media outlets, which might as well be formal formal government uh, media uh, bureaus because they act uh, just like that. Uh, it, 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 it's really uh, I mean we have a lot, an awful lot of work to do. So I'm glad this program has has uh, helped to further that cause. Well, even more important, I'm really glad that this program's now on the Ron Paul channel because, as you recall, Ron Paul was, was one of the ones that started this whole idea of getting people to think. Well, it didn't start it, but he was a, he was a catalyst in that presidential debate where they're all talking about 9-11 and so forth, and he's the only one that says, well, the reason they came over to kill us is because we, the, meaning the federal government, were over there killing them. And, boy, everybody pounced on Ron, and they, they bombarded him. Oh, you're blaming us, all the standard nonsense. Well, that was when Ron Paul's campaign took off. And I remember him saying later on, he says he thought that his campaign was finished at that point. That's what caused it to take off, because there was a certain number of people in society that were watching that and heard about it and said, you know what? He's right. He's speaking the truth. I mean, we really showed the power of truth, even in the context of a political race. And so all of a sudden, you know, hundreds of thousands of people start supporting his campaign and voting for him, uh, I think primarily because of they, they realized 
uh, the role that U.S. foreign policy had played in the 9-11 attacks and generating the anger and hatred and so forth. And th those people are underneath the radar screen. I, I, I think that we may be having a much bigger impact than we can ever imagine. And I think the mainstream media, the the official, the unofficial spokesman for the governments uh, around the world, the imperial governments, I think they suspect it too. So I think there is some positive coming out of this and that more and more people during this period of rationality and sound thinking are figuring it out and they're saying, you know what, it's time that America moves in a better direction. Anyway, time's up. That's the show for this week. This is The Libertarian Angle. Uh, I'm Jacob Hornberger. That's Sheldon Richmond. We'll see you next week.